So hello and welcome to BioAffairs. Today I'll be teaching you about the immunological aspect of diagnostic test. It is a very important topic for all of your exams. So let's try to understand this process named as agglutination. We know that antigen antibody reaction can be explained in two ways that is agglutination and precipitation. But in several ways like the visibility of the antigen antibody reaction and the ease of performance we choose agglutination is most favorable regarding the diagnostic test compared to precipitation. So first we will learn about agglutination. So what is agglutination? Agglutination is the combination of an insoluble particulate antigen with its soluble antibody. So here you can see that the antigen is in insoluble form and the antibody is in the soluble form which will form a visible clump which will be observable through naked eyes. So that agglutination process is most commonly employed to several immunological tests which are employed for different diseases. Now this agglutination process is of two types, direct and indirect. I will explain one by one. Let's first go to the direct agglutination process. Now the direct agglutination process is of two types, slide agglutination and tube agglutination process. As the name suggests, in the slide agglutination process, we can use uh, it for blood grouping, cross matching and other serotyping processes where the bacterial suspension is directly employed on a glass slide, clean grease free slide and there anti one drop of anti against the particular bacteria, I have given here example of Hebrew quality. So suppose you are giving a suspension of Hebrew quality sample one loop full of suspension on a clean grease free slide then upon that you have to apply one drop of the anti which you want to confirm okay or you may use for four or five types of anti which you are suspecting for the particular case that time you will be observing a visible clumping in case of positive test which is a slide agglutination positive test whereas in case of negative there will be no visible agglutination process and the sample will be looking like a hazy milky solution. So that is a perfect negative. Now in case of tube agglutination which is most commonly used for quantitative analysis. This is a qualitative analysis means it will say in case of slide agglutination it will say you about the positive or negative nature of the sample. But in case of tube agglutination you can directly assume or employ or you can know the titer of the antibody present in the patient serum. The most common examples I have written here already, Wardle test, Coombs antiglobulin test which is performed from mother with BR who are generally RH negative but BR RH positive baby and against that there are immunological reactions which can be proven by this kind of method. Now next is Paul Bunnell test used for infectious mononucleosis and cold agglutination process which is employed for mycoplasma pneumonia. Now what happened here, the antibody title is determined by the visible agglutination in the highest dilution of the serum. So you have to dilute the patient's serum and there you will be applying the antigen. So the dilution, I will give you an example, I will also teach viral test in detail in the later classes so that you can understand the process. But for now, you just assume that you are making a dilution of 1 is to 10, 1 is to 20, 1 is to 40, 1 is to 80, 1 is to 160, like that. You have prepared 7 to 8 tubes. And in between them, whichever give you the highest dilution, whichever highest dilution give you the agglutination, visible agglutination, that will say you the titer of the antibody. And it will also assume that the patient is positive for the particular virus or bacteria. That is the efficiency or the usefulness of tube agglutination methods. So both are very essential methods. Now I will go to the indirect agglutination processes which is very essential to explain how precipitation mechanisms can be converted into agglutination process to ensure the effectivity or increase the or enhancing the effectivity of the agglutination process. So let's see the indirect agglutination process.
Now, in case of indirect agglutination test, as I have told you, the principle is to transform the precipitation reaction into agglutination reaction so that the technician or the person who is performing the test can easily identify the positive and the negative test and make a difference between them so that it can be efficiently easily reported to the patient. So, as I've suggested, the soluble antigen here is coated onto the surface of carrier molecules. This is very important. So, how you are transforming a precipitation reaction into agglutination reaction? By using carrier molecules. You may know that in precipitation reaction, the visibility of the uh, antigen-antibody reaction is very, very low. We cannot easily visualize the positive result. That is why here we are transforming the process with the help of carrier molecules. So in general, there are several carrier molecules which can be used, but the mostly used are RBC, lattex beads and bentonite molecules. Sometimes bacteria is also used as a carrier molecule. I will tell you about in the next few minutes. So, the indirect passive agglutination test can be divided into three processes depending upon what it is detecting, antibody or antigen. So, first one is the lattice agglutination test. It is the most widely used test for several diseases which detects the antibody in the patient serum. Whereas, the next one is the reverse passive agglutination test which detects the antigen in the patient's serum. And the last one is the co process. So in co process, a bacteria used as a carrier molecule. And in case of reverse passive agglutination molecule, the RBC can be used as well as some latex is also used. So I have told you already that latex agglutination method is a separate method divided in case of indirect passive agglutination. But again, I have written here latex and agglutination test. So I will tell you what is the difference in both the cases. So let's understand. In case of latex agglutination test, where the latex beads are used, these beads are made up of polystyrene molecules and may get a diameter of 0.8 to 1 micrometer. So what is the usefulness of this carrier molecule is the antigen is coated upon on these beads. So, whenever you are applying the patient's serum upon the beads or the patient's serum is encountered with the uh, latex beads coated with the antigen, it will form a visible clumping that can be easily identified. So, polystyrene beads, patient's serum, one drop of patient's serum you give onto the antigen coated bead solution, you will be observing a glutation reaction. Let's have an example like ASO test which is used for anti sterilizing O antibody test. So it is very common test in several labs. The principle used here is the latex agglutination test, where we detect the antibody in the patient's serum. Coming to the next one is the reverse passive agglutination process. Here, as the name suggests, antibody is coated onto a carrier molecule. So remember, that in the direct cases, the antigen is directly interacting with the antibody. But here, either the antigen or the antibody is not directly actually involved, but some carrier molecules are involved in between them. So in case of reverse passive agglutination, antibody is coated in a carrier molecule. So in the previous one, we have coated antigen on the lattice beads. Here antibody is coated on the RVC or lattice beads. So, if you divide this reverse passive into two processes, first one is the reverse passive heme agglutination and the second one is latex agglutination for antigens. So, one by one, the reverse passive heme agglutination, as the name suggests, heme agglutination means RBC is involved there. So, RBC is used as a carrier where antibody is coated. What antibody? Which will detect the, here I have written an example, hepatitis B surface antigens. So those antigens will be recognized by the cognate antibodies that is already coated onto the RBC. 
So if I draw an RBC, suppose this is the RBC. So here antibody is coated. This is provided in the kit. And if I and suppose this is the AGBS AG antigen which will be bound to the antibody and it will give you a very rapid formation of agglutination. So it will not only save the time but will also definitely useful for the identification of the viral or bacterial cases. Now coming to the second one, latex agglutination for antigen. Here the latex agglutination was used for antibody detection. So don't be confused. Here the latex agglutination is used for antigen detection. What happened here? Here the antibody is bound to the latex beads. Whenever I am telling you latex, that time you have to understand the latex beads are used here for identification of the or for detecting the viral or bacterial antigen. So the examples of CRP, RA and capsular antigens in the CSFs. These are the common examples of the tests which are performed regularly on a lab. But the principle we follow here is the latex agglutination for antigen under the reverse passive agglutination process. So I hope you are understanding these mechanisms. Now the last one under this indirect agglutination process is the co-agglutination. It is a very crucial process widely used in the past but more recently it is not used. Mostly latex uh, bead solutions or latex bead, bead based tests, tests are used for this several types of diagnosis. So what happened here, the S aureus, so bacteria, Staphylococcus aureus is used here as a carrier molecule. So here we have used latex beads, here we are using RBC and latex and here we are using S aureus as the carrier molecule. So there is a specific protein on the surface of a bacteria S aureus which is called as protein A. This protein A has the capability to bind the human IgG. FC region of the human IgG onto it. So scientists have just uh, discovered this and utilized this process and attached the IgG FC region to the protein A molecule on the surface of S aureus. Now you have the bacteria which is used as a carrier and antibody tagged. Now this antibody is specific for the sample antigen, whichever whatever sample you are using for whatever disease that is either bacterial or viral. I will give an example here for salmonella which detection can be used for urine in blood. So this S aureus carrier molecule is used for the detection of salmonella molecule in urine and blood. So this the square molecules I have drawn here is the salmonella antigens S antigens. So salmonella antigens are detected by S aureus carrier molecules. So don't be confused. Here S aureus molecule is just a carrier molecule. It is not interfering in the antigen antibody reaction. So I hope you are clear with the direct and indirect agglutination process. If any doubt you can connect me in the telegram or you can uh, write in the comment section. So if my classes are really helping you in your studies and it is really clearing your concept and if you really like my classes give a big thumbs up. And don't forget to subscribe my channel by affairs.